Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tim Besley and I'm a member of the Economics Department here at the LSE as well as being Chair of the Board of Economica. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Economica Coast Lecture given by Sir Richard Blundell. His topic will be Human Capital, Inequality and Tax Reform, Recent Past and Future Prospects. This lecture, which is one of the most important events in the calendar of the LSE Economics Department, is in memory of Ronald Coase, who was a member of the LSE faculty and the Nobel Laureate in Economics. It recognizes the fact that he published one of his most important papers on the nature of the firm in the LSE Economics Journal Economica, and Economica now publishes the Coase lectures in the journal. It's wonderful to have Richard Brundle from UCL and IFS as tonight's Coase lecturer. After graduating from Bristol, Richard took a master's at LSE, where he came under the influence of the late, great Terence Gorman. And from memory, Richard, we first met at a conference that Terence organized at Nuffield College in Oxford when I was still a graduate student sometime in the mid-1980s. After a period at Manchester, he moved to UCL, where he's now David Ricardo Professor of Political Economy, alongside his role as research director of the IFS. Richard has made a range of important and influential contributions in applied microeconomics. This work has innovated methodologically as well as creating important insights into how the world works. Central themes in his research include the study of labor supply and savings behavior in many different settings. Richard has been recognized by a wide range of prestigious prizes and fellowships too numerous to list in a brief introduction like this. He also served as president of the Econometric Society, the Royal Economic Society, and the European Economic Association. Last year, he was knighted for his contributions to economics. Alongside his leadership in research, he has played a pivotal role in, both, in building up both IFS and UCL into powerhouse brands in economics. To summarize him in one line, I would say that Richard is an economist economist par excellence. Any problem he's worked on is illuminated by his contributions, and we're privileged indeed to have him this evening for the Coast Lecture. I hope you'll join with me in welcoming Richard Blundell to the lectern. Okay. Thank you. okay. Thanks very much, Tim. It's uh, fantastic to be back at LSE again. Um, I should say, I guess this is the place I learned to uh, love economics, or at least if you can dis distinguish love from addiction, it's uh, some, one of those two things. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, let me, is, um, yeah, it's up on the screen. The screen's going to be quite important because this is a uh, um, a, a non-technical presentation, and you'll see some ideas here, but it's very data-driven. It's kind of late in the afternoon, even now the evening, so um, I'm going to try and use the data to tell a story, uh, which many bits of it are going to be extremely familiar to many of you, uh, but hopefully there's some uh, new thoughts in amongst all of this. And um, what I want to uh, look at is, um, is the interaction, really, between inequality, the labor market, uh, tax reform, human capital. And that's going to be the theme. So uh, let me put a bit of background to this. It, it's, um, it's, the upside, of course, of being an economist is that uh, the recessions are always very exciting periods of time. And this one is super exciting. Uh, if you're a labor economist, it's just like a dream. Um, it's like a dream because we really don't fully understand what's going on, and that work nightmare. But, um, <laughs> but, um, and it get you know uh, what's become really clear. I'm not really going to allude to this very much, but uh, studying what goes on um, across different countries has also been uh, you know absolutely kind of really exciting because again, what's happened in, for example, North America versus what's happened in the UK is uh, staggeringly challenging to most ideas we have about the labor market. And indeed, um, that's what I, I'm going to look at a little bit about the labor market. I'm also going to try and, conv tr try and convince you that the UK is both interesting and uh, it's um, got some, you know, some really uh, key things that we can uh, learn from. Uh, of course, the UK has become a little bit like the US 
as we know, and the US has become a little bit like the UK. We now have uh, fall in real wages during recessions, they don't. We have employment keeping up during recessions, they don't. And uh, they're all things that we'll, uh, we'll think about as I'm going through this. But whatever happened, we were already worrying about uh, inequality and um, and the, the and and earnings levels certainly at the bottom uh, of the distribution and the recession has deepened that and uh, what I want to do here is focus on the UK so the UK is going to be my running um, running illustration and uh, I'm going to look broadly at uh, three things. Um, Contextually, what's happened to living standards and inequality? Uh, what has the tax system done, welfare system, to contribute to that? And what could be done to, to perhaps uh, uh, help in, uh, in, 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 um, in dealing, if you want, with uh, the problems that we have currently? And how has this changed in the light of the recession? So it's going to be uh, that kind of uh, background, a lot of, a lot of data. Uh, very few models actually at all, but perhaps alluding to models as we're going along. What I want to do is then uh, bring it all together with a few ideas, some provocative, maybe not that provocative, um, uh, about uh, what we might think of as prospects for um, reform and prospects for the economy. And I kind of flip here between um, moments of extreme depression and uh, moments of quite uh, positive thinking. And uh, I was telling Tim, as you'll see, the positiveness comes with uh, it, what seems to be the remarkable success of, uh, of graduate, graduating BA education. And, uh, and that's going to be a kind of key idea here um, in the UK, uh, which exceptionally, has, as you'll see, is um, has pushed uh, the number of entry kind of work the entry code of workers in the UK over the last 20 years has had a phenomenal increase in those with uh, with um, BA or university level uh, qualifications and we're going to argue that that's uh, been pretty successful actually that's the kind of success side the uh, reverse of that is that the bottom of the labor market it looks horrible and uh, it seems to be growing in a horrible way in the sense that there's a strong complementarity between um, between uh, education and schooling and college and uh, what happens afterwards we kind of knew that uh, if anything, it seems to be growing, and uh, that has implications for inequality and on the way we think of the tax and welfare system working, given that we worry about redistribution. So the emphasis will be on the labour market and on uh, tax and welfare reforms. Uh, one reason for looking at the labour market is that uh, the trends in income inequality and in overall living standards uh, for a, a long time now have been driven, and especially in some sense since the financial crisis, have been uh, driven by changes in the labour market. I'll list three here. We're going to kind of uh, 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 dig deeper into them as I go along. One is the first point of, I, I made, the huge increase in entry cohorts with at least a BA degree during the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, it's phenomenal. I think it's... Uh, it's unprecedented in any other developed economy, and uh, it hasn't been studied so much. Steve Machin, if Steve's here, and uh, others have studied it, um, and we're working on it all together, in fact. And uh, that's going to be uh, quite important to learn from that. There's, of course, at the same time, the large increase in the very top of the distribution uh, since the early 1980s, and since the recession, the dramatic fall in real wages. Um, and of course we can add to that the changes in the economy, changes in asset prices, particularly housing, uh, immigration. Um, as we see, immigration generally makes the workforce more educated um, and uh, that's an interesting thing to look at as well. Uh, or the immigra Im immigration in the UK has made the UK labour uh, uh, working population more educated in the sense they're generally more educated than the indigenous population on average. And then on top of that, reforms to taxes and welfare benefits. So I, all I'm going to do here is put together a little story of what's happened and try and draw some uh, ideas from it. 
So to dig a little deeper into this and the other questions, what's happened to living standards and equality, I'm going to look at three measures um, that I'll argue all have something important to say. You kind of learn something about what's going on from each of them. And um, one is just earnings, what's happened to employment, wages, human capital, productivity. Um, incomes, I'm going to focus on working age mainly and consumption, durable and non-durable. In each one of these, this recession has been quite exceptional uh, in the distinction between what's happened to durable and non-durable consumption. It's been phenomenally different to any other recession we've had. And uh, that's, um, that's also a, a somewhat depressing side of it, uh, as you'll see. The, what I'm going to infer from the consumption behavior across the distribution is that um, for many people, this looks like a permanent loss in their uh, standard of living. The idea in all the work I've been working on recently in this field really is to uh, not particularly focus on one measure of inequality or welfare, these are all economic measures, uh, but to use the links between them to uh, learn something about the dynamics of inequality and uh, standards of living. Um, you can think, if you want, as the labour market driving things, um, that wages and productivity comes, changes occur. Uh, they go through to earnings, so there's a kind of reaction in the labour market, possibly labour supply. Through to joint earnings, there's family labour supply. By the way, in this recession, uh, both on pretty much every, in pretty much all economies, but in particular in the US and the UK, it's been often called in the US a kind of man session. That is, it's hit men much more than women. Women have survived much better during this recession uh, in terms of simple economic measures, measures of uh, employment, uh, labor supply, those kind of things, particularly older women, actually, as you'll see. And uh, so the joint earnings idea is qu becomes quite important. And in fact, if you're at the bottom of this labor market uh, with little in the way of assets, there are really only two things that keep you afloat. One is the welfare tax credit system, and the other is uh, family labor supply. It's a kind of old idea, but it's turning out to be uh, quite important, in fact. And then moving from joint earnings uh, through to income, you've got the tax and welfare system coming in there. And then from income consumption, you've got savings. Of course, one other ex extraordinary thing that's happened during this recession is that saving rates have risen despite the fall in, uh, in uh, earnings and income. And uh, in fact, yesterday we saw quite a big rise in the measured saving rate. Of course, nowhere near the level it used to be, but nonetheless risen quite considerably since the beginning of the recession. So you're going to see the, the depression in consumption. A key point here is the extreme deviation between non-durable and durable consumption, and uh, particularly the decline in, in food and expenditure and necessities, which is, of course, in a simple model of uh, of uh, lifetime behavior is very indicative of the way people think their future might hold up. Um, so to investigate these, I'm going to draw, I'm not going to give any detail of more or less any model, unfortunately. But there are a set of papers, that's what's become exciting to me, that I've worked on with others, mainly at the IFS, but also uh, others uh, more generally on uh, each one of these particular linkages, and each one of these has a hugely more detail, of course, than I'm going to give here. Um, the first one, then, is really all the work that's uh, become pretty, uh, pretty interesting and, of course, very uh, publicly of interest as well in just exactly what's happened with living standards and poverty in the, in the UK recently. Um, and there's a set of reports, and I'll draw on some of that work. Uh, of course, there are other people working on that. There's um, work that we engage with, actually, with John Van Rien and Steve um, Machin as a little project, really, to think about the link between what happened to productivity, the productivity puzzle, i.e. the very, very low, unusually low levels of productivity in the UK economy over this period, and uh, how it relates to wages in the labour market. That's kind of ongoing. It's pretty interesting, actually, and I'll try and draw that in. Um, that's, of course, going to tell us that a lot of what's really driving 
the good and bad things in the economy are around productivity levels and it always becomes the important key here. Um, then there's uh, exactly what's happened to household consumption in some detail using all the data we have got through not just this recession but past recessions too. Uh, in a very slow and depressingly slow way, we're back gradually collecting better data on consumption. Typically, there's no admin data on consumption, so the great explosion of admin data hasn't helped much in that sense. But things like uh, and understanding society, for example, the follow-on from BHPS now collects much better consumption data. And in the US, the PSID um, and now has fantastically good um, consumption setting and I've always think and I'll try and argue here that that's pretty informative actually and bringing them all together is important here. The, uh, the, la the second to last bit of work here, I'll just run through them then I'm going to go through some evidence. Um, nothing as much detail as you're seeing here. This is trying to bring a story of what's going on. Um, the other thing that I become interested in and is I think pretty key certainly in the UK economy but I know elsewhere too is the interrelationship between um, human capital and wages and then labour supply and uh, in particular for women and uh, what i uh, just allude to is a very strong complementarity, as I said earlier, between education levels and uh, future wages. Uh, you can see that very strongly in the data. That's kind of growing strength. And of course, with the huge increase in the population of educated women um, and the fact, as you're going to see, that the wage premium keeps up pretty well, that's an extremely uh, important part of future uh, increases in, um, in overall uh, earnings, real earnings in the economy and that's going to be a key thing and uh, it's also very sensitive to uh, tax reform as we're going to argue here. And then finally the work that I've worked on in great detail in trying to understand how um, uh, how uh, the labour market is used in by families uh, to um, uh, to shield themselves from uh, shocks in the economy, of course, if they can use the labour market. The fact that this recession has been quite skewed towards men, um, in particular in the US actually, has let room, as you were, if you want, for the families to uh, adjust on the labour market margin. And uh, what that work does is look at the kind of double whammy of the recent recession, which is a sequence of labour market shocks together with a set of asset price shocks, which um, of course remove the ability to use savings so much or wealth in net equity and housing to shield your consumption or to keep consumption, as well as uh, some uh, pretty devastating shocks to wages and employment, especially of uh, prime age and, and younger men. Okay, so that's a bit of the background. Uh, the prospects preview, I'll come to that in the end. What did I, what, what's it going to suggest? Nothing particularly um, perhaps surprising, but um, it looks, if you put this together, it, it's, it's not just a recession effect, the, uh, the problems of low real, real wages at the bottom of the labour market. That just looks like this complementarity is just um, suggesting that those with low skills are just bobbing along at the bottom of the labour market. It doesn't look like there's any way through that. And I'll try and argue, of course, there's the upside of perhaps some buoyant employment, um, uh, but low real wages at the bottom. And uh, that implies that low-skill workers in families or families with low-skill workers will increasingly rely on the benefit and tax credit system and probably other family members uh, to support their income and consumption. And the long-term earnings growth comes mostly from high-skilled occupations. And then if you put that together with the tax system, of course, with growing this kind of growing earnings inequality effectively, there's increasing pressure on the tax and welfare systems, and uh, they're kind of creaking a little. So um, we know that the current tax system is, is pretty, in a, it, it, it does some redistribution, but it does it and raises some revenue, but it could do it much more effectively and much more fairly. And uh, what I'll argue at the end is there's some big potential gains from tax and welfare reforms that enhance human capital and earnings 
and address inequality, although not to shy away from the idea that underlying this, you know, productivity is going to be uh, a, key, a key important thing. So let me take through some, uh, some data. Uh, on, I'll start with, I'm going to go through the three sets of data and try and draw out a story. Each one of these, you may have seen uh, some of these bits before, I'm sure, but it's good uh, to look at uh, what's been going on, in particular on wages, employment and productivity. Uh, we know that average real wages fell back strongly as the recession came along. And uh, you might think, well, is that composition, you know, somehow uh, things are getting worse in the labour market, it just looks like the lower wages, because it's going to go exactly the opposite way. As you'll see, you know, the strength of the education changes, for example, will suggest that if you, once you adjust for composition, there's a much, a much larger over decline, overall decline, uh, because the workforce is has shifted towards more productive types, both in terms of immigration and uh, in I education. And real wage pools occur within individuals. I think this is the first time, this is a shock to many labour economists, of course, um, that 20% of uh, re real wages, um, sorry, there's 20% of workers have seen their wages cut in nominal terms hourly wages cut in nominal terms, um, and uh, a, me a very high proportion had, uh, had effectively nominal wage freezes early on throughout um, in the middle of this recession. That's a kind of challenge to the way we think the labour market usually works. What's rather extraordinary, I'm going to argue, is that the education premium, that is the difference in earnings or wages between those with a BA or above, and those without uh, stayed pretty uh, constant, pretty stable over this period. It, it has been stable for a long period, even though we've had this increasing number of uh, educated in the labour market. This is very different from a model, a kind of general equilibrium model, where you get entry cohort that's much more skilled, it drives down the skill price. That doesn't seem to be happening to a large degree anyway. And uh, in other work, we've tried all the standard, uh, pushing the standard models. Um, uh, quite heavily there, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, we have some idea, which I can certainly go back to, on the way um, uh, endogenous kind of ta technical change within firms that allows that to happen. It also is the case that wages pretty much keep in line with productivity overall. There's deviations, but over this period, and we'll argue that this is not a relabeling or some quality effect going on here, or a bargaining effect. Uh, this is a real change in the productivity of um, workers, so that's going to be a very positive thing. Very bizarrely, during the recession, real wages have fallen, uh, but the premium kept up. So you could say that, um, that education was a kind of insurance to uh, the, the drops, although, uh, of course, everybody's seen a, a drop in real wages, although recently, uh, well, over the last two or three years, um, the, the BAs have generally done uh, rather better. Effective labour supply has reacted uh, during this recession. It looks like it's increased, and I'll go through that a little bit, but that's partly due to uh, policy changes and partly to wealth and, and long-run real wage declines. Uh, that's what I'm going to argue. So there's been some response there, particularly among women. Uh, as you'll see. Just a bit of background, if you hope everybody can see this, um, because this is all we're going to get now, just data, uh, a ver variety of levels of data drawn from a, the, most of these, uh, the papers I discussed. So what we saw then, just thinking about it, um, is that uh, output fell uh, more strongly to begin with than uh, hours or employment. Um, and then it, they, they all grow a little bit together. But of course what that means is that productivity uh, just falls and keeps, keeps low. That's the worst productivity level uh, after recession that we've ever seen. And you can see the green line there is output per hour worked because there's, um, you know, the labour supply reaction makes a bit of an effect here. And that really isn't anywhere near where we were at the beginning of the uh, onset of the recession, so um, productivity looks uh, horrible. Um, and if you just, you know, there's nothing particularly new, I just updated the figures. 
it doesn't get any better, really. Uh, there's a little bit of an uptick now, but not much. It, these are the two previous recessions, often making that comparison. Beginning 1979, quarter four, very similar timing to the US, actually, if you're familiar, more familiar with uh, US recessions. Early 90s as well. The UK didn't have, really have the recession in the early 2000s that the US had. And um, its next recession really has been this one. But you can see how different they are. And I'm going to use that comparison a little bit to uh, try and shed light even in this aggregate data, but I'll try and do it with microdata. One problem with looking back uh, is we, the microdata gets a little less reliable as you're going back that far in pretty much any economy, and that's no different uh, here. If you look at um, mean uh, weekly earnings then, so uh, here's the big build-up during, uh, this is just from 2009, and go back even further in a minute. There was even stronger build-up in, uh, in uh, weekly earnings uh, over this early period. One problem with measurement is that uh, not all data sets tell exactly the same story, and, um, and you can see the differences here, and some of my colleagues have been working on that uh, quite considerably. There are two points here. One is the data measures different things, like the labor force survey or the CPS in the US is a household-based survey. Um, it's very good for certain things. It covers a lot of different things people are doing. It's fairly representative. Um, ASHI is, is an administrative data set, effectively, uh, from firms, and it, um, you can see it tells a slightly different s story both before and after, but they all point to exactly the same overall picture, that there's this big, this is relative growth, which is even steeper, by the way, in the late uh, 2000s. It slows down. In the US, it completely stagnates over this period. Um, and then, uh, then there's this huge drop, and all the data points to that, and uh, we kind of know that. Um, the LFS points to it being a little bit more stable recently. I've got some, uh, some, uh, some uh, belief that might be the case. One other thing to note is that we don't measure the earnings of the self-employed. We have no measures of the earnings, no reliable measures of the earnings of the self-employed. This is just employees. And over this period, there's been a continuing growth, as we'll see, particularly among older workers. One, one increase in their labor supply has been in self-employment. And if you just take the, uh, the distribution of self-employed incomes, uh, as far as we can measure them, they are heavily bimodal. The self-employed are in very, very high wage occupations and, or high wage jobs and very low wage jobs, the bulk, bulk being in low wage jobs. And uh, that's going to be uh, quite important as we go, go along through this. But a big uh, drop here. And uh, what's been, uh, uh, this of course is a common feature of recessions is the young typically get hit harder. And you can see this is the decline here for uh, the, those in their 20s, in the, like this just measured in employees in the labor market. This jump up here is all largely, it's, it's a feature of two things that were going on. This is just wages, so it's a feature of effectively one thing, and that is um, really the way you measure uh, prices and inflation. Um, because over the first period, remember, there's a big drop in interest, and if you have any measure of inflation that includes um, that includes it, housing costs, uh, like um, re the retail price index with uh, adjusted for prices, which what we're using here, because you might want to worry about housing costs here. Um, there's two points about that. One is the big drop there then sends real wages up a bit. Otherwise, it, it would look just like this, only it would be flatter here. You're going to see some increase in um, in uh, wages and income coming from two other sources. One is the public sector uh, falls in wages didn't happen so quickly, and so you get some uh, continuing growth there. I'm going to split in a minute between the two sectors. And in addition to that, you've got, um, of course, um, increases in the real value of benefits and tax credits, which are going to hold income up, not necessarily wages, but you'll see that in income in the first part of the recession in a natural way that you'd, uh, you'd expect. Uh, if you just look at change in real median hourly earnings, then, you know, it's really horrible for the young here. And uh, that's, we're going to see that coming along. Here's the difference by uh, gender, by sex. There'll be a lot of differences going on here. Um, 
men uh, get hit on, our, on uh, the median for men gets hit much, much more severely. And uh, you're going to see that both in their incomes and in their uh, employment and hours. Uh, it's going to be quite an interesting feature of what's going on here. Just looking over recessions, um, this is something we always used to see during recessions. There's a kind of pile up, um, well, that's over all years. Let's look at 90s. Or Generally, this is um, real zero, real earnings zero, real growth in earnings across two periods. This is um, real hourly wage in the uh, ASHI data, just looking over time. So it's quite a big sample, just looking over time here. And typically what happens is real wage, the, the generally uh, real wages, ke wages keep up with, uh, with overall inflation. And you can see, if anything, they do a little better in the 80s. Um, they do a little better in the 90s. They do horribly in, the, in this recession. Uh, if you did looked at the U.S., you'd see pretty much the reverse. Uh, so there's there's a you know huge debate about why real wages in the U.S. have been they don't grow very fast as you know, but they haven't shown any change in growth over the over the period of the recession, at least just the measured. Uh, of course, there's big change in composition in the U in U.S., but we've seen this big uh, fall here, and uh, and uh, by the way, it's pretty much exactly in line with productivity. There are different productivity in wages, as we know from John Van Rienen's work and others, have become more uncoupled recently over the last 15 years than they used to be through pension contributions and in the US through contributions to health insurance. Uh, but once you include those, they look, line up pretty well. Uh, what's happened recently in terms of pensions, of course, it's gone exactly opposite to the big increase in the wage from pensions. Recently, um, workers have been uh, contributing less and the fewer workers in pension schemes as well. So, in fact, if you add in the effect of pensions onto real wages, you get a further 3 or 4% decline in overall real wages. So pensions are not going to help us explain this. They do help explain the difference between productivity and remuneration, at least on average, uh, but they don't help in, at all in thinking about the puzzle here. This is the composition effect, which I thought was kind of nice. Um, it's, uh, all, all that's happening here is you're looking at the actual changes over periods. Uh, this is the very rapid growth in, uh, in wages in the UK, um, oh no, the early, uh, pre-recession period in the, in the 2000s. The late 90s is even faster growth here. This is the actual growth, um, and the blue is the actual growth, and you can see it fell back and then fell back more strongly. Um, the brown bit here, or whatever color that is, um, is the composition adjustment by the fact that the workforce is getting a little bit more educated and a bit older. Uh, and if you composition adjust, you can see that the declines are even bigger. So again, composition doesn't help at all here. Um, remember, in, in uh, yeah, generally that's the case in, uh, in this kind of uh, hit through recessions. So here's the, is the, is the uh, looking a little bit more deeply into education and why I think this is something we kind of knew. But it's a pretty interesting feature of the British economy that, um, and the impact on the labor market. So these are different cohorts. Um, and these are the proportion uh, across all in these cohorts. Uh, born, um, so the youngest cohort here, sorry, the oldest cohort is born in the early 50s. And the latest is born in the late 80s. And um, this is the proportion with at least uh, a BA degree. Uh, of course, there's lots of things you can do about equip making these equivalent. And what's happening over time is this, the, you know, the British were so uneducated relative to anywhere else. And of course, people are getting qualifications through their lifetime. So there's a bit of surprising, but there's an uptick in uh, BAs here. It's not just recall. If you look at the BHPS, you can see people getting qualifications. Um, if you, you'll see this even stronger for women. I and mean, women were, in earlier cohorts, were so poorly educated in terms of uh, formal degree qualifications that almost I existing in a modern economy, you'd expect them to become more qualified. So there's a little bit throughout a cohort. But the key thing is these two cohorts here see this massive change in uh, 
the proportion with at least a BA. Of course, as uh, Steve Machen's pointed out quite strongly recently, there's been a growth in postgraduate as well, especially recently, which is added to the inequality, of course, within, a, within the education group as well. But look at the, the huge change here. And now we've got cohorts in, in their late 30s with um, around 40% of, a, of a, a cohort with uh, a BA or above, whereas it used to be way down here. And uh, that's, uh, that's quite incredible. It may be for us Brits, you know, this looks, you know, this is what we knew. Uh, if you put this in front of uh, any audience from anywhere else, they just can't believe it. The US never had anything as low as this. Uh, now we're at the level of, uh, of the US in that sense and many other economies. Uh, here's the other bit of evidence uh, that's very comforting, at least to me. There's lots of reasons why you might get this, by the way, and I spend a lot of time worrying about this. This is all those different cohorts, and this is the... You can do lots of adjustments. I'm just going to do the ratio of medians, probably not the best thing ever. But you think of this as the kind of median return, or the difference between the medians. I shouldn't call it the median return. But this is the premium... Uh, uh, in the middle of the distribution. I've got this for every percentile. It doesn't change because earnings inequality in both groups have risen, um, but the differentials have stayed remarkably similar. It's kind of interesting. But what you see is, can you even see a difference in a cohort? Look at how big the expansion in education was over this period. It looks, uh, looks like nothing's happened to the premium. Of course, there could be lots of things explaining this. Um, and uh, I might spend some time going through those. But I'm uh, going to try. Uh, I believe that it's pretty for sure that this is a real change and this is a real return to that education. It's pretty comforting for us educators, I guess, that this is here. Um, it shows another strong thing that th this, this uh, huge um, increase in the early ages. This is, of course, the, the huge p kind of gradient that you get. Sorry, my feeding back here. A huge gradient you get from education. Uh, what's pretty interesting is here, we, there's, a, there's a big expansion over this period in education, a big increase in employment, and then we get the recession coming along, and again, you know, the young, look at the young during the recession, there's really nothing going on on the premium here, so that's going to be uh, some important evidence. I take this as positive. So remarkably, no cold effects. BA premiums staying largely constant over, even through the recession. And I including immigrants does nothing. I immigrants are slightly better educated, but they take slightly lower wage jobs, as Christian Dussman and others have pointed out, than their education would otherwise predict. And maybe that will change over time, but that's what you find. And adding the educated in, see, you see a, an increase, slight increase in the proportion with BAs or above, as recorded qualifications, um, especially from Eastern Europe, of course, uh, but very little effect on the wage premium. It doesn't really bring it down at all, it just keeps it looking along. What about um, males and females? Well, here you can see the extremely low levels of education in older cohorts of women, and then the even stronger growth in, uh, in education levels of women over this period. What's cool about this from a kind of a, a very basic kind of, I wouldn't call it econometric point, but evaluation point, is that the cohorts are being expanded at different amounts, and so you can really test theories by looking across these cohorts where some have expanded a lot, some have expanded a little, some are in the public sector, some are in the private sector, and, uh, so, and we have different genders here. And you can see the, the huge impact in uh, women to the point where I, I doubted that picture when we first got it, but it, it holds up. And notice, if anything, the uh, premium for women has stayed even more closely aligned. That's pretty uh, interesting. Uh, so this, uh, I would argue, the payoff to education, at least over these expansions, has been uh, pretty impressive. If you just pull apart, this is kind of going back to uh, panel data, but to just following people over their careers and looking at kind of average life cycle wages. Um, this has all the problems that econometricians are set to deal with. It's just um, the average log wages among uh, women in the BHPS, actually over 17 years, that's the, 
the panel data for the UK um, looks the same in any data set you look at. It's not adjusted for selection or anything like that, but it tells the story which comes out very strongly in the econometric work. Um, that is that the higher educated have this very, very strong profile. The low educated uh, maybe have something going on here. Then they bounce along at the bottom, and there's very little you can do about that. Um, and the middle educated get a, a middle effect. What's interesting about this is that it kind of stays up. So the key thing about women is that uh, women, it, it dips down a bit here. This is the experience effect kicking in. If, if women were in the labor market and not in part-time jobs, but in full-time jobs in the labor market, uh, this would increase much more uh, strongly. And that's, you know, that's a key issue here. But it's also the case that the return to education is, um, is not just about uh, the early part of the return, but about its length. And so the effect of uh, e extending career lengths on the return to education, I think, is quite important. And I'm going to argue that's, uh, that's a kind of key part in thinking about uh, uh, reform, in fact. So employment and labor market participation, let me, uh, let, this is where we can see, again, the impact on, uh, on women. So women still um, way, of course, way under the labor market participation rates of men. Uh, for all the obvious reasons, uh, but you can see it's been growing a little bit over time, uh, but during this recession and coming out, it grows much more strongly. That's uh, important. It's coming from a number of sources. I'm going to point to three that I think are quite interesting. Um, one is that uh, there are a lot of reforms on the uh, incentives or carrots and sticks, if you want, uh, to the working behavior of lone parents and in particular job search requirements and all the, the uh, being uh, introduced as children the youngest child is of younger and younger ages uh, whether we like that or not we can kind of discuss when come to reform but one thing you can see is it really does uh, surprise I was surprised by this myself it does kick in this is just the cohorts after the policy of lone parents employment and you can see it really kicking in there. Of course, there's some more formal analysis of that, but I think there's some evidence that um, the labor supply responses among, uh, from policy changes at the, among lone parents has contributed to female uh, increase in female employment. There's the, um, also the state pension age, which is a rather remarkable effect that, uh, of course, many women in the state pension are also in occupation schemes that didn't change their retirement age, but nonetheless, there's quite a big effect. And generally, this is a little bigger than you can ever explain by the incentives in the pension system. It seems much more uh, kind of normal, uh, some kind of idea about what the normal rate of retirement is. And you get, it in a very simple, because it's so age dependent, you can do a little discontinuity design, really, around the SPA effect. And you can simulate the effect of what happens, what might have happened if that hadn't had increased. So some of the increase is due to that as well. Um, and I've got lots of pictures on that. But I'll still the other is the growth in employment, especially among women, older women, in self-employment. And that's. Uh, here, this is a self-employment rate of 60 to 74-year-old women, and it's growing very strongly. So you get that um, important uh, effect there. I'm going to try and put these together. Um, what we might argue, certainly since the recession, is that uh, there's some effects of wealth and, and uh, real wages on the behavior of women in the labor market uh, and stay in the labor market more than they would otherwise, uh, otherwise do. This is not just true in the UK. This is a, another kind of staggering effect, I always think. Even in Spain, which has everywhere else, the, the labor market's falling apart, but not for older women. This is the employment rate for older women, is the green line in Spain. It's in every single country I'm looking at here sees an increase. Germany is the kind of phenomenon where there's a huge growth in employment and, of course, a huge growth in inequality as well. Um, and if I had time, I'd spend more time on that. Um, and, uh, and this light, lighter brown here is the growth for women in the UK. Much higher, of course, in the UK, but now overtaken by Germany very quickly. 
Uh, for men, there's a similar thing going on, even for Spain, it does drop back, but um, you see things going on there. But for young, you know, there's a drop everywhere, and the big drop there that's like a cliff is the employment of young men in Spain. And so I'm not going to do any cross-country things here, but I just thought it's kind of contextually quite interesting uh, to look at here. So let me move um, to income inequality a little bit, because that. so what I'm trying to do here in... Uh, it is kind of take uh, little bits of evidence first on what's happened to wages and uh, labour supply and employment. Now I'm going to try and build that in to what's happened, try and think about how, how that's impacted on uh, incomes, uh, together with the way uh, tax reform and the tax system works. And uh, of course, you've got um, income growth uh, had already started slowing in the 2000s, uh, with pensioners doing relatively well, working age uh, young, working age, childless, already doing poorly. During the recession, real earnings for those in work fell, employment rates fell for the low-skilled young adults, but not for older ones, we've seen that. And the benefit tax credit system is doing a lot of work here. I'm going to show you, if you just look at regular kind of middle income inequality, it didn't change over the last 15 years. There's been no growth in it. If you just take the standard 1950, 5010, or 9010 for the UK, it's a very stable, series, shockingly stable. And uh, that's largely uh, the tax and welfare system doing a lot of work. And the fact that most of the income inequality is at the, in the top, uh, in the upper half of the distribution is driven by the very top of the distribution, not in the 1910, and that's going to be uh, important here. As a result, uh, income inequality, if anything, fell a little bit, um, but low-educated adults did worse. So let me just take you through that. So this is, this is kind of going back to 1997, so new government. <laughs> very strong growth. This is the median and mean income of... Um, uh, growing and then as everywhere in the world something happened in 2000 strikingly in the US it's still that was the puzzle to labor economists until the recession happened that um, in in the US employment and earnings generally begins to uh, tip in 2000 and that's uh, something we still don't fully understand here it goes along and then the recession comes along there's some growth here a little bit from the uh, changes in uh, I I I in in prices that uh, uh, with with housing costs going down, but largely because benefits uh, were keeping keeping up. There's a bit of growth in equality, as you can see, difference between mean mean and median happening here, and then there's a fall, and the median and the mean go down together. So overall, this is you know very similar things happening to everyone. Then a little bit of stabilisation as we come near. So it's kind of interesting to see what happened here. Because um, if you take the, uh, the first part, this is um, up to 2010, the recessions, kind of 2007, 8 to 2010, um, ev the, uh, the tax and tax credit system's doing all the work. There's a little bit of fall, um, not much change in earnings, as we saw before. Tax and tax credit system doing a huge amount of work because it's, uh, it's still increasing in real terms even over that uh, period. Um, then we come the second part of the recession. Already the uh, changes to the tax credit system in particular, welfare have changed. There's nothing much happening here. These are just kind of keeping pace with the decline in earnings. Earnings are doing all the work and overall total income falls back uh, completely. So you get this period where the tax credit system and taxes are doing a lot of work holding up real incomes and then they fall, begin to fall apart. And that's kind of interesting. If you look over the whole period, then you get um, earnings really being the driver. So when I said the labor market's doing everything here, really, the labor market is driving pretty much everything we're seeing going on in inequality here. And that's, uh, that's what we're going to see there. To the point that weekly earnings inequality, um, in many countries in particular here, it's, this is the percentiles, and you can see, apart from right at the bottom here, always difficult to figure out what's going on there, but generally there's an increase in inequality in earnings. That has to be true from everything that I've shown you already. A lot of that's driven by the young 
and a lower hours of work among the young rather than lower wages. But you can see that overall that, that must be the declines are lower, uh, are higher at the bottom than at the top, or higher around the 20th, 15, 20th than that. But actually, if you look at um, income inequality overall, it goes the other way. And uh, this is pretty important that um, the tax and transfer system is doing a huge amount of work over this period. This is, uh, this is the private income distribution falling much more at the bottom. We're at the 25th percentile, 25th percentile here. But this is the actual income distribution, and it's doing a huge amount of work. That's pretty key because it's just not going to keep doing that amount of work. And uh, so that's where, you know, the, uh, the whole uh, kind of future comes in. So will it continue? Well, you can see from this, this is just simple simulations that in simulations of what's going to likely to happen, it's the low incomes that are getting hit more, a little bit at the top too, from... Uh, from tax and welfare changes largely, and that's, uh, that's pretty important. So that's something to bear in mind. Just two aspects of the tax system I wanted to touch on. Um, I'm just going to pick on a couple that seem pretty relevant here. One is kind of taxation at the top, and one is taxation and welfare at the bottom, uh, both of which are up for, as it were, for, uh, for, for review. Uh, they're particularly difficult to reform, both of them. This is the, our crazy uh, top income tax system. Uh, just, you know, this is uh, one, one picture from the uh, Merley's review. It just looks at the income tax system right the way across the employer cost distribution and adds in uh, national income contributions. Just to point out, if you want to treat national income tr contributions as taxes, which they largely are, then it does give you a very different picture of marginal rates. Uh, but because of the way the personal tax allowance is treated in the tax system, you get these bizarre jumps in the effective tax rate, which uh, some, you know, I know people who got letters from accountants pointing out that this was going on when it happened. And then the 50 uh, pence tax rate here, so this is 2011, 2012, it drops down, and then maybe next year it will go back up to, 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 um, to 50 the key issue, well, one key issue I think is important, but it's controversial, is that uh, taxes are very different over different sources of income. And, uh, and uh, a lot of the reason it's very hard to raise, uh, raise tax revenue on higher incomes is that even at this level, this is just the higher tax rate, if you look at the difference uh, between, say, dividend, the taxation of dividends and the taxation of income, they're quite different. And if you look at... Um, something familiar, certainly to some people here. Uh, just look at the bunching around the tax threshold, which there is some bunching, but if you decompose that, it's largely uh, dividends, actually. So a lot of the shifting that's going on is, you know, as people have pointed out in many papers now, especially um, people here, for example, that uh, the easy things to shift are shifted around. But of course, for tax revenue point of view, that's pretty important. And so if you can adjust your Remuneration, uh, especially in higher incomes, that makes it very difficult to raise taxes there. And uh, I think until we fix this, it's not just dividends and capital gains, it's the way housing and wealth generally is taxed. Um, then it's going to be very hard to do much at the top. And so that's going to be one thing. What about at the bottom? Well, this is before y the wonderful universal credit. Um, this is, again, 2011. The, this is a single parent, and uh, again, when you put this up to a non-British audience, they're kind of surprised. This is the, this would be the uh, income that individuals get after paying some taxes, by the way, and this is the net income they would get after all the tax credits. It's a particular point. Of course, people were different in the amount of tax credit they're eligible for, housing costs and what have you. But you can see that it's for a low uh, income uh, parent, it's highly redistributive and it has very high effective tax rates as well, part of the system. It's also complex, of course, one idea was to uh, make the sim system simpler and universal credit was supposed to do that. Of course, it didn't do it very effectively. Uh, but at the same time, um, if you really want to uh, uh, if you, if, you, if, if, if this redistributive system is partly what was holding up uh, those low incomes that we saw just 
earlier. But as we've now started reducing the amounts of these various factors that individuals can get, both in tax credits, housing benefit, and what have you, then it becomes, of course, the tax system and welfare system does a much less good job at the bottom. Um, my view is it just has to do a good job at the bottom because uh, if you look at what's happening to wages, apart from family labour supply, I'll argue there isn't anything else going on there. And uh, if we worry about inequality, then um, that's going to be uh, key to get this right. And we can discuss how we want to do this. Then just finishing up a little bit of the inequality discussion, um, you could see this is another, I was kind of surprised by this. I knew that inequality rose very strongly in the 80s. That's when every measure of inequality within any group increases. This is the 1910 in the UK over this, sorry, the 1950, the splitting the 1910 into the 1950 and 5010. It's pretty stable and in some sense it, it's falling back a bit. I have no idea why I haven't. I think that goes out to 213. I've got all the uh, figures up to 2013. But it's very, it's kind of stable. And uh, we know c because we see the earnings inequality coming partly from the education differences, I'm going to show you even stronger differences for younger people, um, that this is the tax and welfare system doing a huge amount of redistribution here, together with some uh, family labour supply, actually. Uh, if you draw on the red line here, on the right hand side is of course the well known point, you've sat through many talks on this, and that's the growth in the uh, top 1% share. It, here's the 1910 now, uh, just showing it grew. Of course the top 1% grew in the 80s too, but the top 1% kept growing, and of course has stabilised if anything fallen back in the recession. Uh, although if you look at the um, if you look at the 99.90, it looks kind of stable because, again, the 90 fell back a little bit too. So uh, it what you think is going on exactly at the top um, depends on, uh, on precise measurement here. Uh, but you can see this strong growth, which is, uh, of course, worried a lot of uh, people. So since the mid-90s, you get over much of the distribution, you've got this uh, fairly stable inequality. Surprising, I thought. Is, um, uh, but this mass uh, growing inequality, and uh, partly I in earnings, but also among younger cohorts, even for income, as I'm going to show you here. And the welfare system, of course, has been doing a lot of work. Um, and there's... Uh, there, there's a kind of interesting point about wealth transfers, of which we in the UK know very little, as far as I've been able to date. But one thing you can now study, both in the Wealth and Assets Survey and also questions about people's inheritance and what they expect to get. And one kind of rather shocking thing we know is that uh, there is an increasing uh, expectation of inheritances, but that's already among the high wealth groups, and so it adding in uh, inheritance as we would expect, only increases wealth inequality. And you can see that. I've got lots of pictures on housing as well, but I've left them out because housing is a key thing, but uh, we, uh, I don't have time to go into that. But let me look at the back to the cohorts a bit, which has driven a lot of my work. And one thing you see among cohorts, these are younger cohorts. This is like the 1970 cohorts. This is decades of cohorts, so these guys here are retiring. In retirement, inequality falls back. Overall inequality, it, you know, as we've seen, is, is, partly, is a mixture across age groups and you see some stability. But if you take any cohort of a particular age, it's kind of striking how the increase in inequality has, has happened. It's really staggering when you look at consumption. I always kind of like looking at consumption inequality. Um, it's true also for, uh, for earnings, uh, if you look at earnings, even more the case. But here, if I take um, cohorts, say, uh, I'm going to take in their early 40s, you know, it's, it's perhaps there's a bit more stability here, but already at a high rate. These cohorts just have much more consumption inequality, and I wouldn't put consumption as just a pure measure of... Uh, of standard living, but it does tell you about something about what's going on and what they expect. And during the recession, it certainly told us quite a lot about what people expect because it's gone exactly in the way. Um, in fact, the recession consumption started falling before 
uh, income, but at the same time as earnings and uh, other bits of GDP. So people were already anticipating the recession before it hit them on income. And I'll show you that figure in a minute. The US is, is out of a, all another order. If you, uh, consumption inequality is very poorly measured, but if you look at wealth inequality or consumption inequality, then younger cohorts just get extremely more inequality. And I put that down to both kind of wealth, the credit market, and their uh, lifetime earnings or earnings. So there's some interesting things there. So the final piece of evidence, then I'm going to try and draw it together, is on uh, consumption. Um, what's been uh, happening there. Uh, we're going to see that there's, there's a fall, the saving rate rises, and uh, it's, it, it's kind of staggering and very interesting what's happened there. There was a temporary VAT reduction, if you can remember that far back, um, as a way of stimulating the durable goods industry particularly. Um, and you can see that a little bit in the data, but it was way back. And when I show you the growth in durables, it just can't explain that. The durables have, um, so here's non and semi durables, sorry, start with non durables, the most important probably. Of course, the shares in these have changed over these recessions, but I thought timing from the start of the recession, we can now go 26 quarters since the recession. And uh, durable expenditure in real terms has just about got back to where it was. We've never, ever seen anything like that before. Uh, and I think that's pretty informative. It doesn't look so bad when you put consumption overall together, but durables and non-durables to me are hugely different things. And, um, it, and they tell a different story. The other recessions we saw growth there. It's even worse if you do things per head, because uh, per head looks worse in this recession. <laughs> and you can see per head, uh, non-durable consumption just hasn't even got back to where it is. I'm not that keen on aggregate figures, so I'm going to show you the distribution across the percentiles of the distribution in a, in a minute. And it looks like this across the whole distribution. It's, it's kind of interesting as far as I can make out. Durables look uh, pretty different. They always do. I mean, this, it, durables just look like they always did. And they grew, in fact, stronger after the 1980s recession. There's a little bit of a, um, here's the, the green is, this, there's a little bit of a, what I think is um, an uptick from a VAT effect around here, but otherwise <coughs> it's, it goes up at a kind of reasonable rate. And of course it has been uh, an important factor in driving overall consumption out of the recession, but there's nothing staggering. It's just uh, happening. People have to replace their durables and there's an effect there. Uh, but you can see the levels there. So here's some, um, the beginnings of some work on um, looking at the distribution. Again, right at the bottom it's always horrible. These are percentiles of the distribution. And these are changes in food expenditures. They're all falling largely. And uh, this is the kind of one that when the recession really felt like it wasn't going to be temporary anymore. Uh, food, uh, food shares of food expenditure, percentage change in food expenditures have just fallen back uh, a lot here. That's very unusual. Uh, we didn't see that in any other recession. Of course, maybe they're, they're switching to cheaper food or something like that. But to me, it's an indication that really, if you can't smooth your food consumption, then things are pretty bad. And uh, it's interesting that it's across the distribution. So it looks like there's a kind of adjustment, because there are other things going on here. But it does add up, because if you look at different types, and this is kind of extremely worrying. Uh, pensioners, which I think are up here, um, are fine. You know, they, we know their incomes have kept pretty stable, and they don't really change their consumption growth either. It's pretty stable. Uh, this group here are, um, are families with children, and that's uh, extremely large cuts across the board here. here. And these are without children. And uh, that lines up pretty much with what we think has probably happened to the situations of those. Especially, this is on the period, remember, so to begin with in the recession, kind of the tax system is keeping those incomes up. Then it begins to fall apart because earnings dominate after 2010. No, it's kind of interesting. So the idea here is that, um, you know, that, that oh, I'm going to more or less draw it up to conclusion here. There's very little in the way of models, I'm afraid. Um, but the, the, uh, so consumption can tell you quite a lot, in my view. And uh, I put a lot of 
other bits of work together on this, but it really suggests that younger workers and families are acting as if they expect a long run, persistent fall in relative living standards. If you look at anything in earnings, it looks like the variance of these persistent shocks have been particularly high for this group, and that's important. We see it from evidence in consumption and saving rates, which I've just, all I've looked at is what's going on in consumption. So real wages, productivity, investment have been slow to pick up, and uh, there's nothing really that suggests the pattern of low real wages at the bottom uh, to do anything but continue, because um, there's two kind of reasons we might think that. One is just looking at, just historically, at what happens to low-educated, low-skilled workers generally, and, um, and what's happened to productivity overall. Most actual falls in real earnings have happened, but of course what we've got ahead is uh, fiscal contraction big time um, under almost anything that happens in the election, but perhaps worse under one than the other or larger under one than another. Um, the other kind of feature is um, something that, again, people have worked on here, and that is uh, what's happened in the middle of the distribution. Uh, it, of course, this is a demand and supply thing, but here's the employment shares by occupation groups in the UK. When I look at this, it's kind of staggering. I can't even see the recession here. It's just a long-run decline, of course, it can be supply and demand here, in the percentage of jobs that are kind of semi-skilled. People would say the middle distribution. All the growth is at the top. There's a little at the bottom, and we know that, non-tradable is a non-tradable sector. And uh, there's, there's kind of room, at the, but so one might think that, in fact, and I tr drew that conclusion here, suggests that longer-term earnings growth is mostly from high-skilled occupations and the complementarity with education, with perhaps some at the very bottom, because those jobs seem to be fairly stable. This is a hollowing out point that many people have made here, but it's kind of important. But if you think about uh, what's going here, there still seems to be much to do that one can th do in focusing on older workers in general, on return to work for parents and mothers, and entry into work. There's nothing particularly new here. Uh, but it does, you know, if you think about this at the same time as you're thinking about reforming uh, the tax and welfare system, you know, um, in the end, a uh, kind of targeting of some kind is going to have to uh, have to happen, I think. And uh, this is where it matters. So in general, um, and there's some big gains here. If you just look at the proportion of, for example, new cohorts of educated women who are not working, um, not earning as much as they, not working as much as they could, and there's room there. We have a system of incentives in the tax credit system which incentivizes part-time work, and that turns out to be a very, a, 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 have a very low long-term payoff relative to full-time work, and that's in one of the papers, but that's going to be a key thing. And of course, nearly all the reforms now are getting rid of that, but I think um, you don't, people will choose part-time work because that's what they want to do, but you don't want to particularly encourage that in the tax and welfare system, and certainly in the Murdy's review and in other more technical work have shown that uh, there's no real optimality to having part-time work incentives, and that's even more key once you bring in uh, human capital effects. And this is the growing complementarity. This is an interesting issue in kind of labour economics, really, is whether there is a growing complementarity, but I think that seems to be the case in the UK if you look across cohorts between initial investments in education and then the profile, the steepness of the profile and its longevity. Um, that seems to be growing, if anything, and that gives you a very interesting idea because you can see where the return to education is, both in the profile and the length, and we need to make sure that the, uh, you know, the tax and welfare system is designed to, uh, so that people can, um, can access those returns. So there's little evidence of earnings progression for the low skilled. So the old hope we had that by keeping people in work they would um, improve their earnings, that's more or less, there's plenty of evidence and I would add to that from this work that that really is not going to happen. Uh, so uh, that's why I say right at the bottom of the distribution it has to be the family and the tax credit system or the welfare system that does all the work and I think that's important for everybody to get out. So families with low skilled workers increasingly rely on the tax credit benefit system 
And family labour supply used to be called almost like the added worker effect, which we all thought was pretty unimportant. It's turning out to be more important than you think. Uh, uh, maybe. Ah, so I've seen some other work here suggesting that too. Productivity and wages are closely related. If anything, wages have fallen below productivity, uh, especially at, low, at the low end and among younger workers. The real problem with productivity, you can never measure it really, apart from in aggregate. It's horrible, so you might think that the role, you know, a key role for the minimum wage is obviously when you see wages falling below productivity. And uh, we think that might be happening now, um, and, uh, uh, but it's very hard to judge. And uh, so I think that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, but I should note that when you match up these simple labour market measures of remuneration with productivity, you have to worry about pensions. But of course most of the um, pension deficit, if you want, is for workers that are already retired. Then it's not going directly to workers that are currently in the uh, workforce. And so generally pensions don't help um, increase wages over this period. They do the opposite. Okay. And then finally, just um, prospects for reform. Well, uh, so you've got growing in earnings inequality and uh, there's increasing pressure, as we saw, and the welfare has been doing exactly what it should do over that period, but it's unlikely to continue doing that. And we knew that's been happening over a long period, and many of the welfare to work programs were about you know, trying to deal with the growing earnings inequality, really. But the recessions really accentuated that, I think. And uh, it's a, as I say here, current systems raise revenue and redistribute inefficiently, um, unfairly. It, you can see that at the bottom, and you can really see that at the top. So to finish with, um, I had a big, big a lot of stuff written on this, but decided it was going on too much. So I just picked on a few things. They're remarkably like uh, what, we, what we found, what we suggested in the Moley's review, actually, which I still think is a good blueprint, even if after this current recession. Uh, except the one thing I was saying to, to Tim that we really missed there was anything on human capital. We, we don't, it's kind of funny, you know, there's all the d debate on inequality has almost missed human capital in some ways. And our review didn't really address uh, human capital, despite the fact that it's a, it seems to be a key issue here. I haven't mentioned early years human capital, that's kind of too long term, although it's probably really important. But nonetheless, you can see the, I'm arguing here that the return to education has been fairly, uh, it has been uh, quite a, a positive success. And there you might think of uh, driving returns, uh, policies around that. So focus and incentives on transitions to work and return to work for women and children. That's enhancing incentives for older workers. Of course, that also helps with, um, it helps, uh, it clearly helps with education returns as well. And uh, that's a key thing. So you want to enhance working lifetime and career earnings profiles. And then the old, but perhaps controversial, but I think still uh, absolutely key, is the alignment of tax rates across margins of income uh, so that you can make um, the taxation at the top more effective and dividends and capital gains there. And uh, I didn't spend any time on the role of um, tra capital transfers and in particular housing, but they're all going in a way that in that um, is kind of increasing inequality. So if we worry about redistribution, we need to worry about those. And we've suggested, I think, um, and I think they hold up very well, kind of ways of reforming both those things. But to quote from Tim to end, uh, these reforms will not be easy. And my guess is they're getting harder. So I found a great quote from Tim, that high levels of inequality can skew the priorities of the state by limiting its capacity to act effectively. And uh, you can, you know, that's really the political economy of making these reforms, and it's not to be underestimated. So I didn't want um, anybody to think that I was suggesting it would. And in a sense, with growing inequality, we're probably, m these things become even harder to uh, get right. And it's obvious why, I think. But it's, uh, it's a really neat point and uh, 
I think that's uh, it's a kind of nice way to uh, bring things to a close. So that's all I'm going to talk about now. I've got a lot of other slides, always too many, um, but it kind of tells a story. So that's the end. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. We have about 10 minutes. If people have some questions, I think it's probably good to collect them in batches of two or three and then Richard to respond. So I'm seeing one here, there's roving mics. If you could say also who you are, that would be good. So I let people leave. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, my name is George and I work at the New Schools Network. I wanted to ask about uh, the Labour Party's policy to raise the minimum wage but, um, to eight pounds, uh, yeah, raise the national minimum wage to eight pounds. With reference to what you've talked about today, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, thank you. Um, there's another hand over here, so we'll go there. We'll go down here, and then Richard can answer. Uh, hi, my name's Adam. I work in HMRC. I uh, just had a question about something you mentioned earlier about the movement towards more self-employment. And I was just wondering what you thought uh, what might be driving that. Is it change to the tax and benefit system? Is it just changing the structure of jobs? Um, or and kind of what might be the implications for inequality? Mm. Okay, and the question um, here. Hi, um, my name is Polly Simpson. I'm from the <coughs> Department for Education. Um, I wanted to hone in on your point on how you're saying that the returns to um, undergraduate degrees has held up, and you said this is a positive thing, um, and that we'd had low wages at the other bottom end. I was wondering, so there's a lot of been international work on the role of intermediate level skills, and so vocational education. I was wondering where you thought this would play a role in reducing inequality, and filling that sort of middle skills bracket that we've seen the decline in. Yeah. Okay, Richard. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I'm not the world's expert on minimum wage effects, um, and, uh, but there are other people here who are. So, but uh, my guess is I have a very simple kind of way of thinking about it, um, but it may be too naive. You know, if the wage looks lower than what you think productivity is, uh, then that's, there's a key role for the minimum wage. And uh, that can happen in recessions, especially for young people. And uh, that does look, there is some evidence that that's happening. So, of course, um, it's, it's a kind of fragile thing because I've got a, I think I've got another slide that one of my colleagues put together, which is from the LFS. This is uh, wages and productivity. And they're, pr you know, they're both, these are what's happened to um, real wages. Um, and uh, real earnings and productivity are uh, measured in different ways, but they line up. So, of course, if we really think that productivity is fallen, my only response to that argument is that I'm pretty sure productivity hasn't fallen so badly among, for young men, for example. And maybe it's fallen a little, but if you see the strong decline. And so there must, this would be a point where you might expect some role for the minimum wage which would uh, not harm employment opportunities. I don't know about the level. Um, in fact, uh, we had a meeting on the low pay. Uh, Steve and I, Mitch and I, ran a meeting on low pay and wages last week where there were a lot of papers on wages, uh, on minimum wages, in fact. And, um, and, and uh, so, uh, the, and indeed, the economist who's on the panel now, the Low Wage Commission, Richard Dickens, who's taken over who's a PhD student of Steve and I, mine actually, uh, taken over from Steve Machin on that committee. And um, it, we were debating that somewhat. So I think there's room for an increase, um, whether, you, whether you think th you know, that's too high. But I think there's, there's room here. One would argue that there's, um, there's room for an increase relative to what we've seen previously. In self-employment, that's a little bit more, that's kind of interesting there. And it's a good point to mention COAS, uh, because a lot of self-employment is about contracting out or outsourcing. And uh, that's become a huge issue. In fact, I saw a very nice paper last week um, on Germany and outsourcing. And that, um, you know, the structure of wage contracts, um, as you get growing inequality, the incentive to outsource so that you can keep some less inequality within the firm or perhaps even take the rents um, outside. And th you know, that's just an idea, but um, one would think that with growing inequality in firms and across skills, 
the incentives to outsource and contract out, just purely from a rent-seeking point of view, are important. And that's, of course, that's exactly Coase's point, what, what, what binds groups of workers together versus those who work self-employed outside the system, say, for clean, being cleaners and things like that, at the bottom of the distribution. Um, of course, a lot of outsourcing is among, is just getting uh, efficiency gains in the supply of high skill. IT resources and things of that kind, um, but that's, and I think that by modality there is quite important. Yeah, the tax structure is uh, is pro self-employment, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, we don't know exactly how important that is, but that's a key issue. And I, generally, it would be nice if we had a flat taxed system across all these forms of uh, of organisational form, and uh, so that's. That's important. Um, but one thing's for sure is that when you look at inequality and you put in self-employed, inequality increases in earnings if you bring in the self-employed, partly because they have more in there a lot at the very bottom and a lot at the very top. And uh, that's going to be important there. But it is one way where um, kind of the family labour supply point seems to be working. So among older people, extended family <laughs> labour supply, um, among older people and among um, some um, workers within uh, low-wage families, there some of the increase that we've seen in employment has come through self-employment. It's grown quite a bit. I think I've got a figure here. Here, self-employment as a share of total employment. It really. It's kind of going up anyway, and then in, here's the recession, it jumps right up. And the problem here is we don't have good measures of earnings, um, really, in that. And even though in the national accounts they apparently call something self-employment earnings, but I, I don't believe a word of it. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually quite hard to, and that's only average anyway. So the best we can do is just look in surveys like the FRS and what have you, which are accounting for all incomes. In the LFS, they don't even ask people their earnings if they're self-employed, so we just don't know. So, uh, and ASH, of course, only covers employees, so that w we know less, and it's becoming quite a sizable part. And if that last blip is anything to, to go by, it's become you know it's a, a very important uh, growing thing there. That's that's good. Yeah, um, uh, the last one on education. So I. Yeah, I was very surprised at the results for education. I still find them a little staggering. You, if you know the economics literature, there's a big literature around some early work that uh, David Card and Tom Lemieux did on the increases of, of, skill, of educated workers in the US. And their argument there was that, in fact, did drive down the wages of those younger cohorts. In fact, David himself then produced a paper that showed that's, that's not very um, robust result. And uh, what we're seeing here is not, it, there probably is a little bit of an effect, because if you have the comparison being the US, the return to education has grown slightly over this period, whereas in the UK it's been stable. Uh, so it depends, uh, you know, so it might be, depending on what your counterfactual is, there could be a slight uh, depressing effect, which you'd expect, and a slight quality. It's not that all these groups are the same quality. But remember, you've got a kind of movement up here. Of the, uh, You have to adjust for both groups when you're doing any composition adjustments. Um, the middle group, I mean, there's two points there. That um, One is those kind of semi-skilled jobs seem to be disappearing, so I'm not exactly sure what to, how to think about some uh, vocational qualifications. And what we're doing is we're including the non-three-year degrees in the um, not-degree group. And uh, that's the premium that's been growing. Uh, so it, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't suggest there is a big return there. So I, I don't know the real answer to that. We know that um, you know, on-the-job qualifications that are externally examined and that of workers get a return. That's the old result that we've had for a long time. But in um, among younger workers, pre-work pre group, I'm not sure. Um, that's an open question. I mean, obviously, you can't go on increasing the level of uh, BA degrees in an economy and expect to get these returns all the time. So something has to give, and we need to look. But it's been... Uh, I think quite a surprise what the effect we've got and that it's been resilient under the uh, recession.
Well, Richard, thank you very much. I think uh, it's probably time to draw things to a close, but uh, I'd say your lecture, real tour de force, covering a lot of ground and, and, and issues which are really, I think, central to the current debates, but, but standing back and looking them through the lens of what the data can show has been really illuminating. So thank you very much, Richard, for, for a really great lecture. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.